My name is Doug Mayo. I'm a county extension director and livestock and forages agent in Jackson County, Florida. While you may know your local county agent well, from farm visits, phone calls, and educational trainings, you may not know the team of researchers that are focused in the areas of beef cattle and forage management. So through this video, we will introduce you to seven of the key resource people your county agents rely on for science-based information. I'm Ann Blunt, forage breeder for the University of Florida, located in the Florida Panhandle, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about the Cool Season Forage Breeding Program that we have at the university. So for many of us who have livestock, we need something during the winter months besides feeding hay that will keep animals in good shape and give them good nutrition. So we have a very large breeding program that focuses mostly on creating forage varieties like small grains and rye grasses that fit the winter months in the northern part of Florida. And today I'm gonna to give you an example of a success story that we've had. This is Legend Oat. It is an oat that we've manipulated photo period and uh, disease resistance so that the plant grows very quickly in the winter months, provides a lot of forage for livestock compared to another type of winter forage that's very popular, ryegrass. So when you look at the productivity of a small grain versus ryegrass, you can see we are much more successful with getting tonnage with uh, a grain type crop. Most of the work that we do in our breeding program is to develop photoperiod and sensitive plants that grow during the short days, and they provide very high nutrition for our livestock industry. We were very interested in developing a very similar type, but in cereal rye. So this is Florida 405 cereal rye compared to ryegrass. And you can see even how it appears, it has a lot more tonnage than even our successful legend oat. So Florida 405 rye was released by University of Florida last year. It has not yet made it to the commercial market. But again, we're targeting manipulating photo period and cool season forages for this region of the United States, the southeastern region, to make our forages more productive at the time in the winter months when we need our grazing available. We do a lot of variety testing for forages across the southeastern United States, and from that we're able to offer recommendations for the livestock producer on an annual basis so that they know what would work best for them in their pastures during the winter months. I'm Dr. Cheryl Makoviak with the University of Florida IFAS, and I'm a soil scientist and focusing on soil fertility and water quality with special emphasis on forage-based agriculture. I'd like to show you what we're doing here and these are multiple paddocks. We've got 27 research paddocks where we're looking at integrated crop livestock systems and different grazing intensities to see if we can improve our um, soil health and also reduce nitrate leaching into the environment. And row crop systems are notorious for losing nitrates, but if we can put a, row, a cover crop in the winter time and then on top of that graze it, and we think we can reduce nitrates. And we've got what we call leachate lysimeters, um, our drain lysimeters, and this is just the data logger, the lysimeters underground. And we're collecting leachate, measuring it, and by doing that with the different treatments, we can determine how much nitrates are losing to the environment. Okay, so you might wonder, why are we out here in the winter time? Well, the cover crop in the winter is what's key for these production systems. Typically, you have a cover crop to help protect the soil from erosion and to um, contain the nutrients for the summer crop. But also, if we can graze this cover crop, we're finding additional benefits in terms of soil health and reducing leachate besides just having the cover crop alone. And, and so that's kind of an interesting um, addition that we're getting a, a little win-win here. You can see cotton down on the ground here and this is a combination of oats and rye and so this will have another few months to go before we switch into the summer rotation. My name is Nicolas Di Lorenzo. I'm a beef state specialist and I'm very excited to share with you today some of the research we've been doing with the main objective of uh, adding value at a cost effect, in a cost-effective way to Florida calves. We had a project last year, we were developing heifers 
with sorghum silage. And the whole idea with that project is to come up with alternative feed alternatives that would allow us to develop heifers and also background calves at a lower cost than it would be with perhaps commodities or any other feed. So what we have right here at our feed efficiency facility, we've been uh, experimenting with sorghum silage is what I have here. Uh, and we had some uh, uh, really good results from last year that show gains in the neighborhood of a pound and a half to two pounds, which will be ideal for heifer development and conversion that really could be better, but we're working on maybe um, improving some of the yields. So our conversions right now are around 12 uh, to one to 13 to one on a dry matter basis. So the summary of the results from last year with a diet of sorghum silage and a 10% distiller's grain we were able to have a total cost of $140 per ton of dry matter, which is seven cents per pound of dry matter. And with a conversion of a little bit less than 14 to one on a dry basis, and an average daily gain of between a pound and a half to two pounds, we were able to stay with a feed cost of gain right below a dollar, which would be ideal considering market situations to add value to those calves and develop heifers in the ideal range of gains for proper development and uh, function in the herd. I'm Jose Dubé, a forage specialist here at the University of Florida, North Florida Research and Education Center in Mariana. And uh, uh, whenever I got here, I was challenged to uh, find systems uh, that um, bridge the gaps and uh, reduce the forage shortage that we have in this region. Uh, I'm happy to say that during this uh, years that I've been here, we've been able to find uh, very interesting solutions. This is one of the best places of the world to grow forages. Uh, and during this time of the year is the prime season, uh, where we can go grow um, cool season forages. Uh, and in the past 80 years that I've been here, uh, we've been able to establish those forages uh, and at, have at least 120 days of grazing, uh, 1.5 steers per acre or more and two pounds uh, per day average daily gain. Uh, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, in this system, for example, we've been also trying to replace nitrogen fertilizer by introducing forage legumes, and we've been able to replace 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, by 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre and still keep the pasture productive uh, whenever we introduce clovers during this time of the year and uh, perennial peanut during the summer. However, uh, there are still uh, some gaps in the system, uh, you know, from October to mid-January and, you know, from the spring to the summer transition. And we found some other options to fill those gaps. Another option that we are uh, trying to do research to fill those gaps that I mentioned uh, is limpograss. This limpograss that I'm standing right now, we planted last uh, September. Today is January 28th, and as you see, it's already starting to green up. Uh, so uh, limpograss is very unique because it's good for stockpiling. So the idea is to have the uh, limpograss uh, for stockpiling. You know, uh, you defer grazing uh, at the beginning of September and then uh, by o late October, beginning of November, you have some good stockpiling option to bridge that gap that I mentioned from October until mid-January. Also, because it greens up uh, early, you can, you can have a limpograss uh, to help during the transition from the spring to the summer. So when you put together the cool season forage, uh, the, the regular uh, summer systems, plus the limpograss stockpiling in spring transition, we are gonna have 365 days of grazing uh, without feeding uh, hay or baleage and reducing the feed cost. That's our goal. My name is Angela Gonella. I'm the Beef Cattle Reproductive Specialist at the North Florida Research and Education Center in Mariana. The goal of the cow-calf operation is that every cow produce a calf every year. But my goal is that help producers not only to have a calf every year, but to target the best moment of the year so we can increase the efficiency of the system, uh, having the best conditions for both the mama cow and the calf. Pregnancy diagnosis is a technology that has been available for a while for producers. Still, we are not using enough of this technology yet. Um, however, by identifying the cow that did not get pregnant, we can cool that cow so we can um, 
just keep the cows that are more efficient in our herd. However, right now we are working in a newer technology that is called Doppler ultrasonography that allows us to identify the pregnant cow 20 days after the first insemination. So we can perform a second insemination 22 days after the first one. Another technology that has been here for a while and we are not using enough is ester synchronization and the combination of ester synchronization and artificial insemination. Those technologies help us to get more cows bred at the beginning of the breeding season. And the use of artificial insemination allow you to bring to your hair the best genetics so you can increase the performance of your hair. However, even if you have the best genetics and the best nutrition and the best environment for your cows, there's a proportion of cows that are not getting pregnant after one single breed attempt. So we are trying to research why and we are trying to investigate how to identify those cows by using molecular technology and genomics to try to understand and to identify the cows that are not getting pregnant. No matter the size of your herd or your management level, there is always room for improve and there is always tools to improve your reproductive efficiency, to get more cows bred at the beginning of the breeding season. My name is Marcelo Valau. I'm the forage extension specialist for the University of Florida. I'm located in Gainesville, Florida. Most of my research and extension programs program is around testing and developing and testing new forage varieties that are adapted to Florida uh, agricultural production systems and also to promote best management practices to those and also learn strategies on how to integrate those new forages into Florida production systems. Uh, one of the projects I'm very excited about is our new Bermuda grass releases. We have um, one that was released a couple of years ago uh, that's Mislevich 2000 and we have new ones coming into the market. We're working right now on propagating planting material to distribute those new forages for Florida producers. And this is a project that is also sponsored by Florida Cattlemen. Not only Bermuda grass, but we also have the Limpograss, new Limpograss varieties that were released by the University of Florida uh, in the recent years. And those are helping producers to close that fall forage gap, both in South Florida, all the way here in North Florida with the research being developed by Dr. Dubek. Another thing I'm very interested on is developing uh, annual forages to put in production systems, especially related to dairy. Uh, one of the projects we have is the Cool Season Forages trial variety trial on dairy. So we go on farm and test a wide range of varieties on farm to show the dairyman which, uh, which performs best. And this information is released in our variety recommendations and you can find those with your, with your county agents to make sure you are choosing the right material adapted to your reality. Same goes for corn. We have two seasons of corn and sorghum every year, a spring and a summer planting season uh, with a partnership with many industries, uh, with many seed companies where we generate information on, on corn and sorghum hybrids uh, for the producers. As an extension specialist, my role is to support the agents to make sure the right information is getting to you and to distribute this information and technology that's generated, generated within our department. So make sure you contact your local extension agent to learn more about our projects and our list of variety selections. Good morning, uh, my name is Pratap Devkota. I'm an extension with scientist with the University of Florida and I'm located at West Florida Research and Education Center. So today I'm talking about bronzy grass, uh, uh, some of its problem and control options. So in recent years, we have been seeing uh, more and more field being infested with bronze grass in, in our Panhandle region. So it is extremely competitive with our forest crop like Bahia grass, Bermuda grass, uh, or other forest crop species. It tolerates overgrazing. So if you look at it in the picture, a uh, fairly overgrazed field, but bronze grass seems to be unaffected. Uh, we see them in, in healthy growing condition, big clumps and also low palatability. They have low palatability compared to our forest crop. And seed contamination, that's, that's one of the issue with bronze grass infestation because seed are similar in size uh, and they are hard to separate uh, uh, during the seed processing. And also that creates an issue with seed certification. So quick information on bronze grass identification. So when we have the seed head, bronze grass seed head usually has three to four racemes, uh, but uh, with the 
uh, with the Biagrass, with the Biagrass, uh, we have two racemes and uh, it is usually in Y shaped and usually the seed head is also longer for Baja grass. And look, looking at the seed color, it is more brown, uh, brownish in color for the branch, branch grass, but for the Baja grass, it is uh, creamish uh, in color. So for the control option, we only have Belpar as a, as a, as a control tool. Uh, so, and also Belpar, when it was applied uh, at three pints per acre, when it was, the research was done with, um, done by graduate student Clay Cooper and Dr. Saylor. So Belpar was applied at three pints per acre uh, and, and also at different rates. So only at three pints per acre or higher, uh, we, uh, we received or we saw good control, about 90% uh, or greater control. But again, it was, the control was not season long or it didn't uh, go for year long. So for year long, on branch grass control, I think we have to come up with multiple history program. So we'll, which go, we're gonna do more research on that and uh, we'll, we'll be following information as they become available. These were just a few highlights showcasing the dedicated scientists serving cattle and forage producers in North Florida. For more information on these and many other topics, contact your local county extension service.